That's good. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation with me this morning, please. Chapter 1. Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Note carefully verse 3, the only book of the Bible that says this. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. This holy word, Father, bless it. Give me unction to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Folks, it took a long time to write the Holy Bible. Starting at about 1900 B.C., finishing the canon of Scripture about 100 A.D., that gives us a time span of two thousand years. You've got a book in your hand right there that took two thousand years to write. Just think about that. Think about that. If this was a secular uh, 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 entreaty, then my friend, you can be sure of this today that it will be so full of errors and mistakes and contradictions that there is no way that you'd even believe a bit of it. If it was written as it has been over 2,000 years by so many different authors on so many different places that you could pick it up and begin to read and you'd say to yourself, how in the world would anybody want to read a book like this so full of errors and mistakes and contradictions if it was a secular work? But the fact that it is not full of errors and contradictions and so forth and so on is proof positive that it's the Word of God. It's proof that it is inspired of God. It has a common theme that runs all the way through this Bible from the book of Genesis chapter number 3 when he talks about the seed of the woman till we get to the book of Revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are 27 New Testament books, 39 Old Testament books. The Old Testament canon of Scripture was completed about 400 B.C. The New Testament canon of Scripture was completed about 1995 A.D. What you have in your hand, therefore, is God's revealed truth and his revealed word to his creation. Like we said in Sunday school this morning, if the devil can cause the word of God to be, if you can doubt it, cause you to doubt the scripture, then he's going to assault your faith. And therefore, we believe the Bible. We believe it because the Holy Spirit witnesses to the fact that what is in you witnesses with the book you hold in your hands, the word of the living God. And the consummation, the final achievement, the capstone, the crowning jewel to all the Bible is the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And rightly so that the, that the subject of the last book of the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the last book of the Bible is written so that it might reveal the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ would have us know in the end time, the end of the ages as we live in right now. Let me say this to you at this very minute. I am firmly convinced that I see an acceleration of things happening around me, that there is no way in the world that it's going to continue without the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either the Son of the living God is going to come and rapture his bride up or God's going to open the heavens and pour judgment down upon this world. There is no way that we can continue with what's happening in America and the rest of this world. There is no way that God will tolerate this and put up with it without either a direct intervention in judgment or catching his bride up to meet him. I hope it's the latter. I hope he says, come up hither and we meet him in the clouds and in the air. So as the book of Revelation is written to reveal, let's look at some of the things that it does reveal. In Revelation chapter number 1, verses 12 through 17, the Bible said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, I want you to notice especially verse number 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire. This identifies him completely with the Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel. The Ancient of Days means that this is the Eternal One. There is no doubt in my mind that this is the Eternal One. The Lord Jesus Christ did not have a beginning. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the 
Son of God without a beginning. He never started anywhere. He has always been from everlasting to everlasting. So the book of Revelation starts out identifying Christ and placing him in eternity in his rightful place. There is none higher and there is none beside our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty that will do the judging throughout this book. In the book of Revelation chapter number 4, we have a revelation of heaven. And this is some of what the Apostle Paul saw when he was caught up there that was unlawful. First of all, we find in verse number 3 of Revelation 4, he was set there to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. We find the rainbow show up first when God gave it as a sign to Noah that he would never destroy the earth again with water. Now here we have that rainbow in heaven, my friend, not part of a bow, but a complete bow. And it is God showing that he's always true and faithful with the covenants and promises that he makes. Here, my friend, we find God saying again that judgment must come from him and him alone. In verse number six, we read in Revelation four, before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Can you imagine a sea of glass? And verse number eight, it says, we have four beasts that cease not Night and day crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. How big is that sea? How wide is that sea? How great is that sea? But we know this for sure. We know there is a throne on that sea, and we know that one sits upon that throne who is the judge of all the universe. We're starting out the book of Revelation by identifying God in Christ manifest in the flesh and identifying the fact that he is capable and he is able, and he has a rightful place to judge everything that exists. And then it says that he is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Even though we have a judgment poured out upon this earth, even though the book of Revelation talks about angels and demons, even though the book of Revelation deals with those that are condemned to hellfire, the beast, the dragon, and all of that, he is separate, separate, separate unto himself. In plain words, what he says he says from a throne of power and might and glory. So we find in Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 8, a revelation of the earth's conditions. In Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. My friend, think about what you just read. We find a time coming when the world will be worshiping the devil incarnate as the Antichrist. It'll be Satan in flesh. This country that you're living in right now has rejected God. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected the revelation of Scripture. Therefore, they have received the spirit of Antichrist. This world is worshiping the devil through so-called science and their religion and everything else that makes up their life. If you had been in Sunday school this morning, you would have heard me deal with the issues of how that, that evolution is a religion that in that religion is leading up to God men on this earth who worship themselves and they worship the devil. So my friend, next Sunday morning, we'll pick it up again and continue on with it. The religion of this world today is the religion of self-worship and self-love in worshiping the devil, amen. So that's a condition of the earth. In Revelation chapter number five and verse number nine, we have the revelation of the saints. In Revelation five, nine, we read this. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. The cross made him worthy. His sinless life made him worthy. The shed blood made him worthy. The fact that he never said a thing for, any, for himself, but it was for someone else made him worthy. The fact that God sent him from heaven down to this world to save my soul made him worthy. If there ever was a worthy one, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, not me. He is worthy. One of the themes that runs through the book of revelation is that the son of God is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of your worship. He is worthy of your adoration. He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your life. Give it to him and dedicate your soul to his high and holy name. Worthy is the lamb. Is he worthy? Yes, he's worthy in every sense of the word. So in Revelation chapter number five, it says, thou art worthy to take the book to open the seal 
seals thereof. In plainer words, you are worthy to pour judgment about, out upon mankind. I'm not. I would not want that burden upon me to have mankind march before me and to judge mankind for his sins and for eternity. No, thank you. No way would I want anything to do with that. But there is one who has the right to sit down on a throne and say whether you go to heaven or to hell. He has a right to judge your soul. He is worthy. He paid for that right on the cross at Calvary when he said, Father, it is finished. He bought and paid for the right to judge us. So the Bible says the revelation of the saints and to the redeemed, look at verse number nine. Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals for thou wast slain and hast, I love this word, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred tongue, people, and nation. If you'll notice the works of the Lord Jesus Christ do not save you. If you will notice, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ does not save you. It takes the blood that was shed at the cross at Calvary to save your soul. This is why the liberal today will say, if you'll live like Christ, if you'll emulate his life, if you'll try to follow his teachings, you'll be okay and you'll go to heaven. And I say to you, Revelation 1-5, he hath washed us from our sins in his own precious blood. Salvation is to look to the cross at Calvary and there to accept the sin offering for your sins to fall down before him completely condemned without hope and without God and plead for the blood to cleanse your sins away and by doing that salvation comes into your heart and to your soul. You cannot be saved any other way. And so they were redeemed. I want you to notice in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, this is the revelation of the condemned. I hate that word, don't you? That's a terrible word, but it's a biblical word. Revelation 14 and verse number 11. Look carefully at the scripture. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. We are at that place. We are not coming to that place. We are at the door of the mark of the beast. The, my friend, that mark is here right now. I say I cannot identify it for you, but I want you to know it is a reality. And that mark will be taken by tens of millions of people. And by doing that, they seal their doom in hell. In Revelation 14, 11, it said, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. If you ever lived in an age where you need to be diligent, it is this one. If you ever lived in a time when man should be watching out of the corner of his eye, it is now. There is deception like a blanket that is coming down upon humanity and you're living in those days. You are living in the end of time. You are living in the final hour. I don't know when Christ is coming. My little short lifetime is just a span of vapor. I'm here today and gone tomorrow. But I'll tell you this, he could come in my lifetime. He could come while I'm here. Hallelujah to God if he did. No greater thing could happen to me than to hear him shout my name, my name of all the names. When he says, come up hither, he will direct that toward me and he'll shout my name like he said, Mary in the garden that early Sunday morning, he'll call my name and make no mistake about it. He won't get me confused with you. He knows who I am. My sheep know my voice and a stranger they'll not hear. And when I hear my name, I'm leaving here, friends. I hope you're ready. I am, thank God, one of the redeemed. So the Bible said the smoke of their torment ascendeth up. Then there is the revelation of the pit in Revelation chapter number 9 and verse number 1. The Greek word apocalypsis, as you've heard me say time and time and time and time and time again, is the word translated revelation. And it means an unveiling. It means to reveal. 
Now, ninth chapter of the book of Revelation is unbelievable. The ninth chapter of the book of Revelation is one of those things when you read it, if you didn't believe the Bible, you'd say, what a crazy thing this is. Who in the world? What in the world? What kind of drunk wrote that? The bottomless pit opens, and these locusts come up out of the pit, and they got stingers, and they don't look like anything that you've ever seen before. The description and definition of them is nothing earthly. It is completely paranormal, yet it is the Word of God. I believe it. So Bible says in Revelation chapter number 9 and verse 1, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Apollyon and Abaddon are the names of this angel that comes up out of this pit. Here is a creature. Make no mistake about it. I don't care how large. I don't care how powerful. I don't care how great. I don't care how beautiful. I don't care how big. It doesn't matter to me what it is. It is still lower than the Lord God Almighty. And here in Revelation in chapter number nine, this angel of the bottomless pit comes up. He's getting ready to come up, folks. The pit's about to open. Demons are already running wild on this earth. Men are running naked through the streets. All you got to do is go to, go to Google and type it in. And in Europe especially, they got naked men running through the streets. Stark, raven, demon possessed. It's coming to America. Just the other day, one of the big mega churches in, our, in, in Australia gathered at New York City and they had this big fladu and they had a cowboy get up on the stage and this cowboy got up there with his, with his guitar. And now my dear friend, would you listen to me? You can Google what I'm saying. He was naked and this was a church service. Are you following me? The day will come when sex is part of the worship service because the world is headed in that direction and this church has already embraced the spirit of Antichrist. I beg you today, reject that spirit and turn to the Holy Ghost and the Holy One for your soul is at stake. You've got to make a choice. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 16, verse 1, is the revelation of the judgments from above. In Revelation, chapter number 16, in verse 1, we read these words. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, watch this, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. My friend, these come in three different layers. They come by trumpets. They come by seals, and then they come by vials. In each case, the judgment is worse. Heaven has been opened, and God is pouring his wrath down upon the earth. It's not my place this morning to judge God. It's not my place today to second guess God. It's not my place today to try to figure out all of the reasons that God may judge. But there's one thing that I will say to you today. He's still my God. It makes no difference, my friend. It doesn't change a thing. The Lord is the Lord. He saved my unworthy soul. He called me out of hell and he wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life and I'll stand with Abraham and I'll say to him shall not the judge of the whole earth do right he will do right hallelujah to God so the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12 we have the revelation of Satan and the Antichrist yes sir the book of Revelation is about revealing things my dear friend Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And then what follows is a battle, a war, between the only archangel mentioned in the Bible and the devil. They lock, my friend. They go to, pot, they go to, bat, they go to combat. They go to war. They butt heads. Michael and his angels take on Satan and his angels. And it's not a light thing. But the Bible 
calls it a war in heaven. We're talking about a spiritual upheaval like this place has never known before. The Bible tells us plain that the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places is all above us, all over this world. Right now the world is being ruled by a satanic elite. And do you think God's going to let that continue? No. He's going to call out the one that's going to stand eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe with the devil. Now what makes me think this in chapter number 12 is directly related to Israel is what it says in Daniel chapter number 12. For in the book of Daniel chapter number 12, God said, Daniel, Michael standeth for thy people. And Michael is an archangel. He is an angel above angels. So in Revelation 12, he is standing for the children of Israel. Have you noticed how the federal government in this country has turned against Israel? Not only have we brought down upon us perversion and reproach, not only has this country turned from the living God, not only is this country right now, while you're here this morning, persecuting Christians, but now, my friend, it has turned against Israel. And my, don't you to understand something? America just happens to be one of the many nations, and it could be here today and gone tomorrow. The only kingdom that will ever stand, and it'll stand forever, is when it says in Revelation chapter number 11, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Notice it's a kingdom with a king sitting on a throne. It's a monarchy. He has a crown on his head. He's a king over the kingdom <coughs> of heaven and the kingdom of God. And both of them come together under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's telling you that there's going to be a huge upheaval in the way men are governed on this earth. And that upheaval is forming right now before your very eyes. You'd be surprised at how many people in this country, right here in America, your homeland, are so sick and tired of the status quo. They are fed up to hear with what the government has been doing to them and the rights that have been taken away from them. There is an underlying current of rebellion that's going on right now in America. Do you know why? Because these governments are satanically inspired and satanically controlled. The Bible said he worketh in the spirit and the children of disobedience all over this world. It has given itself over to the power of Satan. And so, preacher, what are we going to do? Preach the gospel and convert the world? I heard a preacher yesterday. I respect him. He was a good man, a man of God. He's gone now. But I heard him get up in the pulpit, and I heard it straight from him. And I thought, man, where in the world did you come from? He said, now by the preaching of the gospel, we're reigning with Christ. And he said, you need to take that position where you're reigning with Christ. I said, son, we're not reigning over anything. This world's going to hell in a basket. It's going straight to the pit. The church of God is not reigning over anything, but the time will come when we will reign and a king will reign in righteousness. And when he reigns in righteousness, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Yes, sir, that day's coming, and it's coming soon. There is a huge upheaval taking place on planet Earth. Then there is the revelation of the Antichrist, Revelation chapter number 13. What's that, preacher? That is Satan incarnate in flesh. There's the revelation of war, Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 7. War in heaven. Can you believe that? War in heaven. Then in Revelation 19, verse 11, this is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Oh, how I love this scripture. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and, in tr and True, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. That's the revelation, folks, of the king. He had on a crown, and he had on many crowns. He had the crowns of glory. He had the crowns of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He deserved the crowns because worthy is the king. Heaven opened. It opened up and it took Elijah. It opened up and it took Enoch. The heaven opens the day that God saved my soul and sent the Holy Ghost down in my heart. Heaven's going to open again. Say, preacher, I just don't believe it. You will. The revelation of judgment, Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11. This is a judgment that I don't want any part of. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. There is holiness. There his holiness begins to be made known to the creature. 
the holiness of God, holy, 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 separate, separate, separate unto his own element, to his own existence, to his own being, separate from his creation. Notice, the heaven and the earth fled away, but he's still there. And there's a great white throne judgment. If you're unsaved today, that's where you're headed, to the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. I want to go to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. I want to be judged for what I've done on this earth, not for my sins, but for my service. There's a difference between the two. The judgment seat of Christ is not a place of shouting and glory in God. There's going to be some weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at the judgment seat of Christ, but it won't be for your salvation. It'll be for the way you treated each other. It'll be for the works that follow you. It'll be for your service and your faithfulness to the Lord God. He's a good God. If you give a drink of water in his name, he said, I'll reward you for it. Hallelujah. The revelation of the new Jerusalem, chapter number 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Oh, what a beautiful city this is. I've seen the earthly Jerusalem and it took my breath away. I'm not exaggerating. When I crossed that hill, they saved it for the last thing. Brother Bevington would always do that. Bob Bevington, a great man of God, is going to be with the Lord now. I respect him, love him dearly. He would always save Jerusalem for the last part of the tour. We'd been everywhere else. We've been to Galilee. We've been all over the place. And then the bus comes across the hill. And here I am back here. Man, I'm going to tip. <laughs> I want to get a view. I want to see this. And when we topped that hill and looked at Moriah and there the walls and there the city, man, it took my breath away. I thought, Lord, have mercy help us. Here we are. This is the city of the great king. This is where David breached the walls and took it from the Jebusites. This is the city where our Lord was crucified. Here is Mount Zion and Mount Moriah and there's Calvary and there's Gethsemane and there's the, the Kidron Valley and there, my friend, Jerusalem I said hallelujah to God what a place and I walked around in the days for the next few days and I'll tell you right now that's the earthly Jerusalem but the Bible says there's a new Jerusalem now, coming down from God out of heaven 1500 miles that way 1500 miles that way and 1500 mile perfect cube can you imagine how many people you can get in that perfect cube do you realize that every human being that has ever walked the face of this earth could fit neatly within that cube? Therefore, all the redeemed, every last one of the saved, every one of us whose name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life who are going to that new Jerusalem, there's a place in there for you. By the way, it's got walls of, of gates of pearl and walls of jasper and streets of pure transparent gold. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Thomas saith, and he said, whether I go, you know, in the way you know, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? That's old Thomas being Thomas. Nothing wrong with Thomas. He kind of answers a lot of questions we all have. The Lord said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, no man. Now get a hold of that. Get a hold of that good. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then when he showed up after the resurrection, Thomas said, I won't believe he's alive until I thrust my finger into his side and into his hand. Thomas said, I don't believe you. Then the Lord walked right through the wall and appeared. And he looked over at Thomas and said, Come here, Tom. <laughs> Come over here, Tom. Here, reach hither thy thing and your finger and put it into this hand. And he held that hand up and Thomas looked at that hand. He could see the light through the other end. He could see the light all the way through it with a big hole where it had been nailed to the cross. And the big place in the side with a spear from the Roman soldier. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He never touched him. We don't read a thing in the Bible where Thomas ever touched him. He fell on his face and said, my Lord and my God. And you like to think the Lord walked up and he put his hand on the head of Thomas and he said, Thomas, you believe now. You believe because you've seen. He said, but Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. That's you and me. <laughs> that's you and that's me. 
Do you believe? Yes, <laughs> yes I believe. You better believe I do. Oh, yeah, I believe. I believe he's alive. If I didn't believe he was alive, I'd close my book up and go get drunk. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die, nothing to live for. Yeah, he's alive. He lives, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's way. He lives, he said. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. In Revelation 1, he said, I am the living one. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, he said, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. His life gives him authority. Not only is he worthy, but because he lives, he has authority to open and shut. I open, no man shuts. I shut, no man opens. And all judgment is given to me. Bless his holy name. Folks, it's about the Lord Jesus. This is all about the Son of God. Hallelujah. And then the last revelation is in chapter number 22 and verse 1. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, you know, if you know anything much about geography, well, little I know, I know a little about it. I know that rivers have, have heads, river heads. The head to the springs, feed the mighty Mississippi. Have you ever traced it back to its origins up in Wisconsin and on up in there? All these tributaries, they feed that giant river. That huge Mississippi flows down to the Gulf of Mexico and empties itself into the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico. So you know the origin of that river. But this one is not like that. This one is coming up out of the very throne of God. It's a pure river of the water of life. All you got to do is reach down in there and take a good drink of that. Man, you haven't had a drink like you've had in your life. Like that drink. And the flowers and the trees are blooming and jumping up and down and shouting on both banks of it. Life everywhere. Life in the light. Life in the trees. Life in the water. Because he's the prince of life. There he is. And what makes this so wonderful here in Revelation 22? This is eternity. This is the revelation of eternity. Notice what it says over here in verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever Amen. and ever. Amen. That's eternity. No end. That's one of the things that blows my mind always has, always will. Is that this little short span of a few years on this earth, here today and gone tomorrow. Those of you that are 20 years old right now, you'll find it hard to believe this, but you'll wake up one day and you'll be 50. You'll turn around a time or two and you'll be 70. And the first thing you know, you're going to look back upon your life and you're going to say, what in the happened to it? Where did it all go? How do you, I'm telling you the truth. How many of you folks in here been here a while know what I'm saying? It's just gone. Just think about this. You're going to a land where time doesn't count forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah to God. Think about that. Where he called me from and where he's taken me. That's what the book of Revelation is about. Say, preacher, do you believe the book of Revelation is inspired? Yes, sir. Amen. Preacher, do you understand everything about Revelation? No, sir. No, sir. -ree. Tell you in a heartbeat. Many things about the Bible I don't understand, but I believe them. I believe it. I believe it. Word of God. Yes, sir. Right now. Proud of it. Did you know that this is the sixth month of the year? Okay. This is the sixth month of the 16th year of this, of this uh, century. Did you know that the witches and the Satanists have already got some big deal planned for 6, 6, 16? Coming up. they got a lot planned for it. Isn't that amazing how they have to identify with the curse? 
They have to identify with a curse. I came through the line the other day and my bill was $6.66. I said, no, <laughs> I did. <laughs> that woman was startled. I said, huh? -uh. <laughs> so I went over there and got me a candy or something. I said, put that on there. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you keep your 666. I don't want any part of it. <laughs> she was startled. <laughs> but I got my message over. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> All right, hallelujah to God. How many know you're saved today? You know where you're going, glory to God. Wouldn't it be the most wonderful thing that could happen to any of us folks, any of us, is to hear that shout today. Amen. Caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, thank you for the word of God and for the faithfulness of the people and the attentiveness this morning. They listened, Father, and the Holy Ghost for being in their Heavenly Father and witnessing and confirming and affirming His Word to the hearts of the people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. One more time, you let this old boy stand up and speak for you. There's nothing I could ever do with this life, Lord, that's greater than that. You let me stand and speak for you. In the holy name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning. Take three 